Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy. And using a proven tax deferral strategy, such as the Deferred Sales Trust, is an amazing way for you to exit the highly appreciated assets, defer capital gains tax, so you can create and preserve more wealth or help your friends, family, and clients do the same. Hey, we're streaming on Expert CRE Secrets as well. So thanks so much, everyone who's watching us there or listening to us on the podcast there. Uh, each episode, we're joined by some of the best real estate, financial, and wealth minds in the world where they share their ideas, deal stories, and inspiration. So together, we make complex tax deferral strategies simple and uh, passive income plans achievable. I'm excited about uh, our next guest. Uh, he is... Uh, the CEO and managing principal of Red Oak Development Group. He oversees underwriting projects, financial planning, debt and equity strategy, and company growth, and is focused on the viability of projects, partnerships, and investor relations. He has more than 15 years of business experience and has owned successfully operated a variety of companies and has been a sponsor of more than 140 deals. He's committed to being a leader among outdated developers in the Austin, Texas metro area, bringing to life communities that represent a modern design and a plethora of green space and amenities and so much more. Please welcome to the show with me, Tom Staub. Tom, how are we doing? Brett Swartz, how's it going, sir? It's so good and it's so great to have you. And we are for the topic at hand, we're talking client uh, success stories for capital gains tax solutions. So this will be really a story about how we met, how you met the DST and how we work together. But before we get started there, Tom, would you give our, our listeners who get to know you for the first time a little more about your story and your current your current focus? Absolutely. Um, I do this a lot. So a quick 60 seconds. Started doing flips way back in the you know 08 crash. Um, I scaled it up to about 30 to 40 flips, uh, flip, flip to own rentals, syndications and par uh, apartments about three years until Brent Cardone came out. Once he came out, pivoted to land development, starting in Arizona, which we're still in Arizona. Um, fast forward to 2018, pivoted to Texas. Obviously, there's a lot of tailwinds with Texas. We will be the largest developer by 2025 in Austin, Texas. Uh, we are expanding to Dallas, Dallas, Fort Worth, and cautiously San Antonio. So um, to date, we have, oh geez, about 6,000 lots under development, 2,000 units of apartments, 100 acres of commercial, two schools, a med campus, hospital. And by 2030, we'll have about $15 billion of projects um, up and rolling. So absolutely incredible and it's 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 an honor to be able to be uh uh be able to have you as a client and now as a friend and yep. uh but before we dive into that and the dst and how it's helping you to create and preserve more wealth i want to take one other step back you know tom i believe you've all been given certain gifts in this life and these gifts have been given to us to be blessing and help to others so i'm curious go back to the younger days with tom um you know what would, would you feel is the one or two strengths that you've been given and how does that help how you help and bless people today yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, I think later, so I'm, I'm 38, almost 39, so still pretty young. Um, but in my early 30s, I discovered that I have a pretty robust OCD <laughs> issue, I guess, <laughs> where um, it's interesting, right? Because I you hear a lot of developers and multifamily guys and real estate people and stock people talk about profits, upside, yada, yada. But I have always been obsessed with downside. And protection of downside and how to mitigate losses and that's really resulted in me obsessing over trying to figure out why i don't want to do a deal not why i do and that has been prudent on my behalf i have not ever had a deal where i lost investor money knock on wood um i've had a number of exits you know and sometimes you have to pivot but as long as you're protecting that downside it's been a, a really solid strategy for me to gut check all of my deals um and then I think the second one, you know, I, I am constantly learning and, and, and reading and trying to better myself in all different ways. Even when I'm in the sauna or whatever it is, I take books with me in the morning books. Throughout the day, I spend an hour uh, aside for books, trying to learn from the greats in the world of, of, you know, what we call the dumb tax, right? And so those two things have really proven, uh, you know, I guess, um, advantageous in my, in my business. And I think, so, Brett, similar to you, and I, I talked to someone recently about you, um, I think when you, as a steward of capital, are since, like genuinely interested in helping others protect their capital and do right with their capital, 
people sense that and they they tend to gravitate towards those that are truly good stewards and conversely if you think about people who are a little bit I, you know use the word sleazy or a little bit iffy if the gut's telling you something's off with these people i i've been fortunate to find people like you and other good stewards of capital and i think you and i share that same sort of mantra and it's it's gone great for our investors and all of our people that we're along with so Amazing, Tom. Thank you so much for that. Uh, those kind words as well. I want to just kind of summarize that. So uh, having an insight and, 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 a, and an ability to plan for and see the, the, the risk involved in investments, right? And being able to adapt and change as those things have happened. Number two, having like an appetite for learning to always learn from the best and continue to do that so that you make the mistakes, right? You can learn from their mistakes, right? Is no. that and then, then, then a judge of good character. Is that a fair summary of those three? Yeah. Um, it was funny. I was, I, was, I was at Chase Bank yesterday um, transferring money, whatever. Um, and this this young young buck, you know, probably in early 20s was like, I don't know, not to brag, but he looked at my Chase account and said, man, I got to ask, what, what did you do right? <laughs> and I was like, and I, you know, I give him the same principles. I'm like, well, go out and network, find good people and just constantly learn and focus. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. By the way, if you want to learn more about Tom right now, you can go to redoakvc.com. That's redoakvc.com. So let's talk, let's jump right into the, uh, the topic at hand, which is capital gains tax solutions, success stories with Tom Staub. So Tom, take us to uh, before the DST, right? Um, you're, you're, you're doing deals, you're looking at deals, you're looking at tax, right? Take us through kind of like the the big you know problem or challenge that you faced before we started to uh, connect and, and talk about strategy with the DST. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting too. Um, yeah, so let me go kind of back to what, what, what was the genesis of the, my founding of the DST. Um, you will find Brett, is invited to high net worth events, people who are strategic about their capital. Um, that's how I ended up finding him. I think it was through some sort of podcast, um, I think with Marco Centarelli, maybe, good friend. Um, anyway, so I look, looked into it, I was doing an exit. 1031s were kind of like what everyone was doing, but one thing I often see with wealthier people in 1031s, they're fine vehicles initially, but at some point you hit the ceiling. And what I mean is there's only so many deals that are 10, 20, $40 million. And of course, we know about you know about the shot clock forcing you to make bad decisions. Um, and so you do a big enough deal, and then you do another deal that essentially should be doubling your your money. You're going to come up into a corner where you don't have any deals to find, and then you're going to be forced, very very much like VC firms were in the last few years, to make bad choices. And that that's kind of what concerned me is that the path of a 1031 ends up putting you in a corner uh, where that's one of the biggest strengths of the DST from my point of view is that there's this ability to be nimble and flexible um, and there's not really a cap and what I mean is if you decide to buy a multifamily building you've turned around and flip it now you're buying a tower for 20 30 million you flip it make 10 million now you're 40 million dollars that rules you out of a lot of asset classes but now you can pivot and go to a different asset class within the DST that, that's what attracted me to it and then I'll say just before I made a decision, going back to my OCD sort of risk hedging, I flew out to Napa. Uh, Brett drove with, with his you know lovely wife about an hour and a half to meet us, and um, and we sat down with some wine, got him a little boozed up to see if he was truly the character he says he was. Um, and here we are now. So I went through that process to vet him out. Um, so that that's kind of all in one why I chose the DST. Okay, excellent. I'm glad that that worked out. We called you out, man. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was an awesome trip. Um, I think it was Camus, right? Camus, yeah. right? Yeah, Camus. And uh, and you also introduced me to some new some new stuff on wines. Although we were close to Napa, just an hour and a half away. I, um, yeah. Tom's extensive um, uh, vintage and and I think taste yeah. for wine was uh, is definitely more refined than mine. So okay, so it sounds like a ten thirty one exchange, right? And just understanding the strategic kind of back to the OCD downside risk risk hedging. It's like, hey, you've seen enough that as you get bigger and bigger deals, they're harder and harder to put together. And the risk and the, is, it's even greater, right? And I think that also leads into equal, equal, equal greater value, but equal or greater debt, right? That's that's the thing that people, I think, sometimes miss that. And, you know, you give an inter interesting kind of what's going on right now with interest rates that have jumped over 100% in about a year. It's, it's It can put yourself 
in an increased risk position that perhaps you didn't want to be in. So you you kind of like you've seen that, you sensed that, you felt that. And so now enter the world. You something you talked to Marco Santorelli. Thank you, Marco, if you're listening to this. Uh, he's great, by the way. Um, then you're going, okay, let's explore the deferred sales stress. So take us to that next step of just the discovery phase of the DST and what kind of questions someone should be asking if they're looking at this for the first time. Yeah, uh, great question. I, you know, it was very foreign to me when I first learned about it. And even the legal docs are very extensive. Um, now I have a legal team, like many of them. Um, I spend way too much on them, uh, but <laughs> love them to death. I had them double check it. So that checked out. Um, my main concern was, you know, one, is this legal? Um, so it's probably worth talking about that, Brad. Um, I think the structure of how it works is pretty important and it can quickly become complex. But at the end of the day, you know, understanding that piece, which is essentially you're, you're giving up ownership to an entity that you still kind of own, and then you're borrowing from the entity to use those funds or something else. Right. Um, so I think just understanding that process was really important. And that, you know, and you know, I spent several hours going through that and really understanding the ins and outs. Um, so that was helpful because on the outside, it, it does seem complex. It almost seems too good to be true, um, but there are some costs to it. There are some, you know, some things that you have to do, you know, like we, we just did our accounting for this year and sent you over our, our, our K1s and all that. So there's some work. It's not, you know, hundred percent perfect world, but it's, fun. Overall, fantastic. So, absolutely, yeah. And to, and to, to that point, yeah, uh, just just to clarify a little bit. It gives you you can still do the things that you want to do as an owner. I think is the biggest thing that uh, that I would say for our clients, Tom, and that you're giving up ownership of the uh, of of you sold an asset to a trust and you get a promissory note, which is what you have ownership of, right? You're the lender. And, but you still have all of the entrepreneurial freedom and you're a great example, right? You're going to, you're on the path to be the, the biggest developer in all of the Austin area for, for many, many, you have a long runway to go here. Right. Um, and you want to be entrepreneurial, right? And so the ability to still partner with the trust via LLC joint venture partnership, which is kind of the, it, it, I guess a little bit advanced part of the, the, the complexities where the trust puts up the money, where you're not the owner of the trust, you're the owner of a promissory note, but the trust can put up the money and it can partner with you to do the deal. So talk about this stuff, freedom and flexibility to still do what you would have done. It's just yeah. with extra amount of capital to work with. Yeah, sure. So uh, prior to the DST, you know, I, I guess I make money on the, the land deals themselves, but I have to keep the lights on through consistent income. And one of those ways is I have a substantial portfolio of notes and those notes are essentially me giving money to flippers that i've known for many years um and so i already was doing that i did the dst um and by the way those those returns are like 11 percent and three points so you know 14 to 15 percent annualized but anyways um and i essentially just took the dst money and used it for that so and that's a completely you know ancillary opportunity um you know we have whatever was left you know in the account brett said hey it's sitting here in cash. What do you want to do with it? I said, well, let's put it in T bills. You know, they're paying five, six percent. So we, you know, again, another avenue that was fairly easy. Um, you have a on staff advisor that makes it very easy if you want ETF. So, yeah, I mean, you have the ordinary capital markets and asset classes at your disposal, right? So, absolutely, yeah, that flexibility to keep liquidity and to go into the deals you already were going into anyways with that extra. In this scenario, it's earning from twenty-five to fifty percent more. Uh, depending on the depreciation recapture, depending if it's short term or long term and what state you're in. Um, for Tom's deal, it was a larger deal in the Austin, Texas area where he was looking at substantial amount of tax. And so the Deferred Sales Trust can, can help you to do that. So, Tom, you talked about legality, right? So that's one of them, right? I think the other one that's big for the entrepreneur is just how does it work with working with as uh, the entrepreneur, Tom, working with Brett as the trustee, right? And and because there is what's called indirect control, meaning the trustee has to approve of investments, right? But perhaps there was hesitation from going, hey, I've got unilateral 100% control. Now there's a, there's definitely an extra, extra step to keep everything with the integrity because the trust has to, trustee has to approve of the investments. But just talk about how that how that's gone with discussions, looking at deals, reviewing. Do you feel like it's it slowed you up at all? Do you feel like there's been any, you know, anything that you would share with anyone or how's, how's, how's that gone? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'll be honest. Um, it isn't like I have access to the account and I just take the money and, you know, throw over the fence. Um, 
But frankly, I don't think you want that, right? Even if you like, I have other trusts for my family and everything else through, you know, Chase and everyone else. Um, those are even more cumbersome where, and, and, and that's intentional. Like you want to have a layer of vetting, um, you know, God forbid, if you become an alcoholic or something happens, you want to have a third party to kind of keep you in check. There is some level of scrutiny, but that level is more like, great, Tom, I understand you want to use this capital for X, Y, Z. Um, please fill out a document so I can review so that it's within the lines of what we agreed to in the agreement, right? So it isn't like you're a hurdle. Uh, I think you're doing the appropriate, call it um, vetting or auditing that should be done. So it's, I mean, if you're talking about adding 30 minutes to, to a process, that's that's 30 minutes well used. <laughs> right for the for the uh, yeah, yeah, for the, yeah you don't want to yeah. in, and so and then what about the other aspect too and I, Tom you're you're pretty like independent and you're also what's great about Tom as well is we also introduce our clients to Tom and the goal is to also in, uh, be able to help our clients diversify into different projects um, especially in Texas in real estate right so talk talk about just um, strategically aligning you're one of our strategic alliances Red Oak Development is right and how how that, even just that network of all of us, right? This, the tax man in a sense has brought us together, but it now becomes not just a tax referral strategy, but also a chance to build wealth collectively together. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, um, I just had a meeting, and I, I won't say with two, but it was one of your, your referrals. You know, and again, I'm not gonna um, hide things. I'm pretty transparent. Um, it's as, about as good as it's gonna get uh, for a vehicle. But when we sit down with your referrals who have some pretty big exits, you know, they didn't get there on the one-off luck. Sometimes that is what happens. And, and I always tell people this too. It's like, oh, your overnight success kind of situation. It's like, no, it's been 15 years of the right decision over and over and over and over and over. And those small increments have led up to this, right? Th these people that I meet that you bring to me are in the same scenario. You know, um, I have a, a, a guy that you met has some, um, a variety of schools for music. Um, and he has some other properties in California that he's exiting. Again, I won't say the name, but, um, you know, so we sat down and he's a smart guy. He's trying to figure out, again, how best to be a steward of his own capital. And what's interesting is your network, and I've met a you know, half dozen or a dozen people now through you, um, they all have that similar curiosity and just, you know, financial stewardship of their capital, which they should. And so you, you get benefit of working with people who are creative, curious, um, and sort of um, trying to optimize how best to manage their money. Now that I I I, uh, I couldn't agree more. Let's let's now shift to maybe the other objection someone might have, which is, okay, this all sounds really great. I I, I get that it's legal. It's the twenty seven year track record, thousands of closes. You have lifetime audit defense, right? The legal team explains the how to do it, how it works. Got it. Okay, it's all the proven template. What I can do, what I can't do. Right, as the trustee with con with controls and and the things that we have to go through for investments. I get that. I think I feel good about that. But now it's maybe the maybe it's the fees or the 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 because the, the fees aren't aren't cheap, Tom. Right? They're not cheap. But just talk about the 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 way that even you even approach underwriting any deal that you're doing, right? Or any any strategy or any person that you're hiring, right? The investment into uh, the strategy or, or the thing that you're doing. Walk us through your mind for numbers and how you apply that to the deferred sales trust. Yeah. Um... Well, again, I don't really consider the 1031 a long-term um, vehicle. I think it's short-term at some point, you'll have to exit and take a huge hit. So I, you're, you're essentially comparing a tax hit of somewhere between 21 to 30%, give or take, versus a fee to set up the account, which by the way, is very standard with any um, trust. I mean, I just paid, I don't know, 1.5% for JP Morgan Chase um, on one of our trusts, right? So people need to make money across the board. So you, you, you have to expect a fee. I mean, come on. Um, so the question is, do I pay this smaller fee? Yes. In, in, in dollar terms, it's still expensive. Or do I pay this fat tax and just figure out something else on my, on my own? So, but again, I still think it's not, it, it's important not to discredit the team that you get with it, which again is access to a lot of other people, entrepreneurs, yourself, lawyers. Um, and I think you're branching out to other players to help people, you know, advise their financials and everything else, right? 
Yeah, exactly. That, that it's like a family office approach. We try to bring in the best yeah. of the best. That's part of why we're bringing like Tom for investing in Texas and land and developments, right? And we have other strategic alliances across the country as well to try to build like a network of all of us helping one another. Talk about the ongoing fees though, Tom, because it's not just as a one-time fee to the tax attorney, right? But then there's the ongoing, right? About one and a half to two percent, depending on the AUM and where and where everyone's at. Just yeah. talk about um, you know, so the, the promissory note, it's say it's at three million at an eight or nine percent compounding interest rate net of the net of, net of the fees right net of the fees is the goal and then talk about i think it'd be good for people to hear from you like when you partner with the trust you can get additional upside right you're not you're not capped at like that eight or nine because someone like yourself who's used to doing you know double digits consistently over and maybe even you know in the 20s and the 30s right over a period of time doesn't want to forget go those upsides so talk about um how how to partner with the trust and what that looks like for for not capping. yeah well i think so. yeah and this is this is the one complexity that definitely um drew some confusion initially but it's i think it is important to probably walk through that nuance because uh eventually i i chose that um and then instead of having cash just sitting there getting eaten up by four or five percent inflation i decided to take the route of maximizing that, that additional amount of cash so Absolutely. Yep. And then so by partnering with the trust, especially if you're an active GP like Tom is doing the deals, you have an opportunity to 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 basically like earn additional upside, which is a powerful way. And you can also be passive, right? And just wait and just invest with someone like a Tom passively, the trust can, or or other investments um that uh that produce a return. Um and, and then just just basically be at that 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 amount of money but but it's you're not capped if you do the joint venture partnership and that's really the key here if everyone's listening and that's how we make the deferred tail trust an investment and not an expense all right tom so what other questions do you think someone might be asking or even when i have you know potential clients call you to talk to you on the phone what do you feel like comes up that you might want to mention here yeah again i i hit on earlier um who was brett um can i trust him which you know that one i already bet it out um i i do think because of the nature of it sounding too good to be true, I, I think it's important to talk about, yes, the track record, but I mean, has the IRS come to you with questions or like, what do you see in that in terms of trending? Are they beginning to put a magnifying glass? I know there's a couple other people that are doing a DST. And, and frankly, when I've seen them out in the market, I get, they seem a little scattered and I'm getting a little worried that they're going to ruin the, you know, the uh, bucket of clean water for everyone else. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, even recently there was one, it was an uh, IRS, uh, uh, I guess, memo or uh, released regarding a thing called a monetized installment sale, which often people either buckled, uh, put them in the same bucket or get them confused. Um, and even our clients came to us like, oh my gosh, our CPA is saying this. And we're like, that's not, that's not us, right? Um, and in fact, that's the opposite. Those types of, those types of structures are basically giving you all the money up front and say, do whatever you want with it for the most part. And it's still tax deferred, which we call that constructive receipt. So there's nuances to these strategies um, that are compliance based, right? Not just idea based, because I think the way that Campbell Law puts it is every tax deferral, every tax deferral strategy works until it gets audited, right? And so over the years, the 27 year track record, um, every three to five years, there's another strategy that has its runway for a little while. And people go, oh, it's either cheaper or it's it gives me some extra benefit for flexibility. And maybe it doesn't require the third party trustee or whatever it might be, a little less expensive. But those all tend to blow up. And so I would say that's one of the biggest things to understand is that so far it's batting a thousand, um, meaning uh, over 24 no change IRS audits, tens of thousands of tax returns over the years, thousands and thousands and thousands of assets that have been used it. And but also there's a lifetime audit defense just in case because every unique every circumstance is 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 is, is different. In other words, Tom's unique circumstance with being in Texas, what he's selling, when he sold it, all of those things. It's like it's it's like an individual you know ACL surgery, right? Whereas somebody in California or, or or New York or New Jersey or or Florida, these are all individual fact patterns that it's just not a one size fits all template. But so far. It's following the IRC 453 guidelines and the third party unrelated trustee. And if we're following the, what's been built, it's batting a thousand. So that's the best, best thought. The other thing too would be, there's also third parties beyond just us saying this. There's 
then a private letter ruling. There's third party national law firms. There's uh, uh, one gentleman who was a client, potential client, his business ended up the buyer backed out, but he was selling an $8 million business in Southern California. And he goes, Brad, this sounds really great, but you guys are all saying it. He goes, can I go find somebody separate and bring them to the table to vet this? We said, absolutely. Like we're an open book. As long as that person signs the non-disclosure. And he found a former IRS agent who's a tax attorney, whose specialty is looking at tax deferral strategies to see if they would pass muster, right? They're legal. So that guy did about a 90 day due diligence, spent time with, with, with a business partner, Campbell law, went through it all and gave a private legal opinion that was thumbs up. Right? And this is consistently what we see, but for those who they don't have the time and, or they need to trust, they, they want to really just put all of their trust and all of their confidence just in their CPA who hasn't heard of it before. It, it can be, that could be the challenge for people to overcome. But most of the time when we spend the time with that CPA, they join us and they bring us referrals. So any, any thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'll just say it's, you know, essentially pick your poison, right? Are you going to pay your fat tax now and just, you know, assume that something's going to happen? Um, or do you make the right decision now and be smart with your money? And then when it happens, then deal with it. And in that process, keep clean books, keep clean audit trails so that you're not spending hours doing that. That's my take. It's like, look, I, I am pretty adverse in really trying to avoid headaches. I've chosen the path that, you know, my lawyers checked it out, said it was fine. My advisors on the tax side say it's fine. Um, it is a unique instrument to your point. The tax man's always trying to get more taxes. Um, so eventually they might come and, and, and question things, but you don't forego smart moves now for the potential of what could be later. Absolutely. Well said. And by the way, uh, you can learn more about this and get started with your deferred sales trust uh, plan with Capital Gains Tax Solutions by going to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. You can also check out the new book that was released um, on Amazon. It's called Building a Capital Gains Tax Exit Plan. You can get that in the, uh, it's soon to be an audible in about a month, month and a half, but you can get it on the Kindle version and the and the uh, paperback. Hold um, on, Brett. Hold on, hold on. That, that's either... A, that, that's a thick book. That's either like 18 point font or you have a man of a lot of wisdom here. <laughs> so, you know, they say get in the room with smarter people, Tom, so kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. So I, I do have a few chapters for sure with some wisdom, but I have a lot of really other smart people that I got in the room with, like Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. He's in the book, right? He's nice. the first sales trust for the first time on the sale of highly appreciated public stock. And so um, we have a number of, 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 of contributors to the book. So you can check that out. Um, that being said, I do want to touch on um, everything you're doing at Red Oak Development, Tom. So let's dive sure. in. Uh, so talk about the exciting opportunities uh, that you have in the pipeline and or that you have right now in case someone's listening and saying, hey, I'd, I'd like to explore what Tom and, and Red Oak Development are doing. Yeah, so um, we have a sister firm called Centauri Capital where we have a debt and equity fund that helps us fund our deals. Um, one of the things I do every year is I open up my PL or my, my, my profit and loss statement with my accountants. And, and we look at our top spend and we say, are these items that if we brought in house would create more value than the actual cost? Right. So last year we, uh, we did it with lawyers. We said, wow, that's a lot of money, but do I want to own a law firm? No. But the previous year I, I did it for engineering. And um, Red Oak is the founder, or I'm the founder of a company called Viewpoint Engineering. Um, that's a base, that, that's a Texas civil engineering and, and, and design and architecture firm. Um, we're already number three in the market behind Kinley Horn and BGE. So we're on a tear. And if you know me, I'm very competitive. So I'm, I'm targeting them to take over. Um, so that's going really well. But aside from that, we're about a month and a half away from launching a statewide initiative. And we're sitting down with uh, Governor Abbott's office here in a few weeks. Um, it's called Project Lone Star 2030. And one thing I've I've learned and, you know, again, going through my own dumb tax and kind of the, the wounds in the market is smaller deals don't make as much sense in the economics anymore. So a lot of what we're doing is we're buying these 200 to 600 acre tracks and we're building like real communities. Right. So, well, what does that mean? So 600 acres of which 70 percent is going to be homes, all different sizes, townhomes, um, entry level, move up, luxury. Um, they're generally eight to 10 year projects. Um, the other 30% is going to be a combination of a few flagship con concepts. One of those is med campuses, right? So we are, we partnered with a surgery center to bring regional hospitals as well as clinics and kind of your standard services. 
Those are usually seven to 10 acres. So we build those medical offices and own them. We have a seven, 15 acre site on each community for flex warehouse. So think of it as like contractor industrial, that market's booming. Um, BlackRock is now going hard at that. We have a 10 to 20 acre track for our entertainment districts. So we're partnering with, you know, big names here in Texas. I can't give them right now. Distilleries, breweries to create these family sort of entertainment districts. Uh, we give 20 to 40 acres in each community to a school district for free. Uh, and they build a new school in our communities. We also have a, an initiative that I'm launching with the number three superintendent of Texas, Mark, Mark Estrada, um, Homes for Educators, where we aim to give teachers at cost housing um, 500 over the next seven years, right? So we do all that. And in exchange, these cities give us very, very attractive tax rebates in all of our communities, right? And so what we're really doing, Project Lone Star, uh, we will have 10 communities um, some in Dallas, some in Austin, some in San Antonio, where we sit down with every city and county and we say, hey, look, do you want to partner on, partner on this vision? Um, if so, let's create one of the first private public partnerships in the state of Texas. Right. So this will be a 15 to 20 billion dollar initiative over seven years. And to call my bluff, I just hired a third party to double check my math on that. Um, we'll create 10,000 jobs. Again, 500 homes for teachers, six schools, six, med six medical campuses, 10 schools. Um, and we're, we're really trying to change the game when it comes to development. Amazing. Absolutely love the vision. Uh, I love the drive. I love that you've built an amazing team as well. Um, and and uh, and I, I, I love that you're focusing like a laser on making a difference and impact in the communities. Affordable yeah. housing, right? And in Texas is one of the fastest growing, I think, if not in the entire country, in the top, top one or two. Um, it's needed, right? And and those that are going to get it done to uh, are to be able to build these things are the ones that are going to help solve the housing crisis. And so this is this is uh, this is fantastic. Um, that we're pretty much running out of time at this point. Do you, are you ready for the lightning round, fast Tom, or anything else you want to add? Yeah, to let's do it. Best, okay, there we go. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. Knowing what you know now, Tom, if you could go back to your twenty-year-old self, what's the one golden nugget? Make sure to tell yourself to do. I said it yesterday just to the uh, young buck. Network, network, network. Excellent. Question number two, what's the number one book you've recommended or gifted the most in the past year? Ooh, um, Lessons of History by Will Durant. Excellent. Uh, question number three, what are you most curious about right now? Um, is multifamily going to crash in the next 12 months or is it going to maintain its stable path right now? Excellent. Uh, question number four, what's the number one leadership quote or theme that you strive to live by? Oof. Um, not that I try to live by, but one that I appreciate a lot. Andrew Carnegie, uh, the best asset one can give to a child is poverty. <laughs> it's, it's heavy, but it's... It's, <laughs> it's true. I said truth there. Um, next question. Um, if there's one domino that you can knock over for, for yourself or your business, your investors, and that by the end of the year, so it's mid-August right now, 2023, what's the... What's the one thing that makes the biggest impact for um, for the business, the family, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've stepped a little bit away from the business to let my leaders run it, um, but where we are going, um, and we're already in talks with a few partners, we're gonna blow up the market with a massive marketing campaign where we become the experts of engineering design and partnerships through all of Texas. So um, we'll be in every quarter, switching up from Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, doing these kind of mega conferences that teach people really how to develop, how to build communities, how to partner with cities and counties. Um, that, that's a big initiative going into next year. So just building that brand. Amazing. Uh, second to last question. Um, in fact, no, this is the last question. Uh, last question is this. So after all your success, success, Tom, doing all the things you've done, helping all the people you've helped, building all the things you've built, uh, how, what's the number one practice for you and your rhythm of, of habits or disciplines that helps you to stay centered in your values and also stay charged up to reach for even higher heights? Man, that's a great question. Um, I would say, I mean, it's kind of a three part answer here, but it's a the idea is like intentional focus on the self, on the family, um, you know, and that translates into focus in, into work. So I have a, every day, 5.15 a.m., I have my two hours of flow, um, healthy diet, go to the gym, cold plunge, sauna, uh, well, on my off days, um, you know, 
I, I try to drink very little. I, I, I try to eat poorly very little. Um, bedtime, on the same time, I'm, I'm pretty robotic in that sense. But that, that whole routine has been very focused. And um, it's, and, you know, I, I focus equally on my, I try to on my family and my business and my health. So Amazing. Absolutely, Tom. It's, thank you, first of all, for sharing so much wisdom with us. Uh, thank you for, for being a client and thank you for putting your trust in capital gains tax solutions and myself and our team. And thank you for becoming a friend. I, uh, I want to thank you for being on the show. And I want to encourage you to keep using your gift of the way you put it, OCD for risk hedging, number one, number two, um, learning from the greats, right? Absorbing, 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 right? So keep that appetite for learning so that you don't make mistakes and you, you take on all the, all the, all the good things. And then just connecting with people and helping them create and preserve more wealth, make an impact with communities. Um, I so appreciate uh, the time every time I get to spend with you. So for our listeners who want to get in touch with you, would you remind them one last time, what's the best place for them to find you? Yeah, you can e uh, email me, tom at redoakvc.com. Amazing. And I also want to thank our listeners. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to another episode of the Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast as well as expert CRE secrets. I hope you glean some wisdom. I hope this helps you if you're looking at the Deferred Sales Trust for the first time or considering it for uh, one of your clients uh, that you can reach out to Tom or me to learn more and to, to hopefully overcome any false beliefs if it's too good to be true, I don't know it's legal, uh, control, as well as too expensive. We want an opportunity to work with you, show you, demonstrate what the Deferred Sales Trust can mean for you, for you to create and preserve more wealth and help your clients, friends, and family do the same. Please go to capitalgainstaxers.com to get started there and check out the book again, Building a Capital Gains Tax Exit Plan. Thank you so much. And we will talk to everyone again.